and we can start whenever. All right, welcome back, folks. Uh, welcome to episode three. Um, last time we talked uh, in episode two, we were talking about the timeline of post strat forty and ideology and scholarship. Um, it's a fancy way of saying uh, the um, academic or scholarly following behind the doubt of Shakespeare, the doubt of the idea that William Shakespeare of Stratford is the actual author behind the works of William Shakespeare, or the works that are accredited to William Shakespeare. And, uh, last we talked, we worked our way up all the way through Delia Bacon, had to talk about her a lot, um, talked a lot about what Walt Whitman was getting at, and both Bacon and Whitman were kind of getting at this idea that whoever is writing Shakespeare um, has to come from some sort of privileged aristocratic background, uh, not just because of expertise and knowledge, but because of the motivations behind the plays, the um, sort of historical context, the uh, courtly motivations, um, an understanding of how courtly proceedings and espionage and um, all sorts of just political kind of things that may not be explicable for the layman. Um, this isn't the era of CNN, um, though the printing press is coming around. It's not like the era of, uh, say, the Founding Fathers of the United States where they got pamphlets going right and left and people just printing them and printing them. In fact, uh, the main sort of pamphlets we have from this era generally are about the theater itself and uh, we'll, we'll get into some of those later on um, but uh, let's see we can from here go a, a few different ways we can work our way down some of these actual solo aristocrat theories uh, or we can work over into the uh, group theories and um, what we'll do is we'll probably just work down this timeline uh, tried to in this little chart uh, put it together somewhat chronologically so that as we go down we're going down sort of equivalently in time and so uh, if we get into uh, the 1880s uh, Miss Pot um, who becomes a big time uh, a big influence and a, a big foundational figure in the whole Baconian movement she pops up and she literally founds the Bacon Society in 1885, and, um, you know, w one, it's just to honor and revere Francis Bacon for his philosophical theories of empiricism for his other writings, but it's also to expound and propound him as the author of the works of Shakespeare. Um, and so, um... But um, she's not the only person doing this, and she's not the originator of that. I don't have uh, him listed, but there's another um, writer in the 1860s putting a whole sort of work together trying to fully expound uh, what Delia and... Um, scroll up a little bit. Yeah, um, sorry. Um, William Henry Smith are both saying and hinting at... Um, we don't get a full exposition of that till the 1860s or 70s, but by then in the 1880s, it's so much so popular that we have several writers uh, making a living off of it. And uh, um, one thing that becomes super popular in the whole Baconian movement is the idea of hidden and encoded meanings in a text and. There's, I think, a lot of good reason for that. Like, that's a big deal to Renaissance writers. Not just English Renaissance writers, but uh, French, Italian, um, Scottish Renaissance writers that are writing poetry, essays, uh, and they're using a lot of allegorical and metaphorical techniques, uh, using symbols for stand-ins, for ideas, for people, for events. Uh, so we have that on like the literary level, but we also have these sort of uh, word level anagrammatic uh, sort of puns, um, puns themselves. Uh, we have um, um, potentially even uh, 
cryptogram um, type material. So where you have to use ciphers or gematria or um, anagrams, um, just anything like that to encode messages in your plays, in your poems. And uh, a lot of people start latching on to that idea. And um, I mean, it makes sense in a historical aspect because this is starting to get uh, in the pre-information age at the rise of uh, hard science, at the rise of uh, deep mathematics. And so uh, we have a lot of really great thinkers, but one of the first who really pitched the whole cryptogram thing, at least uh, really expounded it in a popular text, is Ignatius Donnelly. And uh, Ignatius Donnelly's super interesting because he's he's what a lot of folks would call a crackpot. Um, I, I don't know that I'd call him a crackpot. He, he's just a believer in a lot of very not mainstream theories. Uh, so he's a big believer in Atlantis and the lost Atlantis Empire and that it was a sort of pinnacle of civilization going off the, the Plato uh, myth in the Timaeus. And... Um, uh, he is not just an, an Atlantis uh, believer, but he's also a believer of Bacon being the writer of, Sh of Shakespeare, Bacon being somewhat a cultist, uh, being a scientist, being uh, potentially in a secret society, and being all those things, uh, as well as a genius, he's encoding tons and tons of messages. And so uh, this is one of the things that really helps propel and influence the whole idea of cryptograms which we'll see that all the way up until modern times like uh we'll, we'll get it on later later on we'll talk about peter amundsen and the things that he's finding and and revealing and um that's a big part of the whole uh henry neville theory is we see a lot of encoded messages or potentially anagrams for the name neville um You'll see that used in a lot of Oxfordian um, theory today as well. Alexander Waugh uses tons of this stuff. So if you like watching Alexander Waugh, I mean, a lot of these techniques are coming from the Baconian movement. Uh, and I don't think that's to discredit anybody that's using these techniques. It's just to show that this is where it first comes out of. And maybe it comes out of the Baconian movement because Bacon's so recognizably the Renaissance man, but as soon as we understand that there are others that fit the Renaissance man model, uh, like Neville or De Vere um, or Devereux or Sidney or um, even the Renaissance woman like Sidney or uh, Lanier Bassano, um, all these people would be using these renaissance literary techniques and so i think it's potentially possible um that several of these people could be using these techniques and uh so let's use that to segue over to our group theory timeline um so while we've got super popular baconian movement going we're getting the inklings of group theory, which itself will become a contender for the favorite alternative authorship theory um, very quickly into the 1890s. And so uh, maybe one of the first big texts is General J. Watt de Pister's was the Shakespeare a myth after all. Um, and he expounds a theory of aristocratic collaboration, including Raleigh, Bacon, um, this may be sort of the basis of what becomes the school of night theory or the school of night myth, which is um, still somewhat maybe used inappropriately um, by orthodox um, scholars or just in mainstream colloquial talk about Shakespeare. Um, this, let me go a little tangent here for a second. There's this idea that there was this group of men led by Walter Raleigh and Thomas Harriet, who was an astrologer, astronomer. Um, but it had guys like Marlowe, had guys like um, George Chapman, um, possibly associated with guys like Giordano Bruno, um, maybe even uh, some of our other characters like Philip Sidney. Um, but yeah, the School of Night was supposed to be a kind of secret no-no group where they would go talk about dirty, nasty, atheist things like science and math and 
democracy and uh, as such it was sort of always thought of in this sort of Victorian judgment sense of uh, the sense of Victorian judgment like no that that's a bad thing uh, school of Knights is a bad thing but it itself uh, comes about because some guy in 1903 is trying to go over love loves labors lost uh, with the quote where Shakespeare says uh, your hues black as hell um, your school of night bloody bloody yakety and uh, he suggests that a lot of people have never understood what that term school of night means and um, it's just possible that he's talking about this little academy that's being referenced uh, here in Love's Labor's Lost. This little French academy is an actual allegory for this group that people like Raleigh and Harriet and yeah, blah blah blah, all those guys are themselves uh, being sort of parodied or satired or just referenced in Love's Labor's Lost as this 1570s French court of Navarre and uh, he must be calling it the school of night because that must be sort of how they were thought of uh, they're going there to talk about bad things in the dark of night um, and so a lot of people uh, latched on to this theory for a long time even in the mainstream scholarship it was popular up into the 1940s and it was you know sort of a way to explain that line in love's labor's loss and uh, it sort of fits met metaphorically with what um he was suggesting, but the thing is, we just don't have any documentation of anything like that. It's all just a bunch of references and um, potential readings and interpretations of a lot of different writers and texts. And uh, because of that, like, we don't have we don't have any document that says like, oh, these guys were going to this place and they would meet at eight o'clock on Wednesday. Like, no, we don't have anything like that. We just know that. Raleigh may have been buddies with uh, Harriet, and uh, Harriet was a big-time thinker who had these sort of political and idealistic leanings that, or ideological leanings that uh, might align and mirror Raleigh, who he did have family connections with, and so um, it's a lot of conjecture and surmise, and so the School of Night thing may not actually be a thing, but it itself, I think, has taken a lot of basis from General J. Watt de Paster's um, 1888 text and so this idea that Raleigh and Bacon are behind it um, that's a really popular alternative to the, the Stratford thing um, the Stratford thing the Stratford man the Stratford uh, theory uh, Raleigh and Bacon are really really popular and um, as much as Bacon maybe is still a popular candidate today. Raleigh is not as near as popular and uh, I think as we go through this chronology we hope to kind of dig out why that exactly is. Um, it may be historical timeline issues. Um, it may be that we just what we have from Raleigh is some poetry and we maybe have enough to say he's he's alright but he's, he's no Shakespeare. Um, but we'll get into that later the point being that he is a heavy heavy favorite as is bacon and it's because they're both kind of themselves these giant mythal mythical figures of renaissance england they they are the sort of hero that the shakespeare persona needs to be and um i don't know that that necessarily makes it right or wrong like um it just i think that's sort of where the cultural psychological point of view of a lot of these 1880s 1890s writers from america and britain and even germany and france and uh, we're going to see some german and french writers on this chart um there's a lot of folks around europe and eventually around the world that want to get in on this conversation uh let's see let's uh let's move on to t.w white he uh, writes this book, Our English Homer. What's he also? What's he also known for for writing? Before we have, because like, what's yeah? Before you can go back up here, what's what's Paster written besides some Shakespeare stuff for the um, lay person to be like, oh yeah, he made that line or he did that significant contribution to what uh, I know. Some of these guys are politicians. Some of these guys are. Uh, 
uh, academics in other fields. Uh, some of these guys are hack writers. Um, so not all of these guys are super famous beyond their Shakespeare research. Some of these guys are just rich, old, white guys, if you want to put it like that. Um, T.W. White's not to be confused with T.H. White. T.H. White wrote The Once and Future King. And so uh, trying to search for T.W. White's writings is kind of a booger. You end up just getting a whole bunch of T.H. White stuff. Um, but T.H. or no, T.H. T.W. White wrote <laughs> Our English Homer, which was a, a long essay or monograph. It was a book um, which it described the plays as a result of an open, consistent, constant collaboration um, that's not always a unified collaboration. You'll get some characters on and off in each plays, and, um, but it's between big names like Robert Greene, who's a dramatic playwright before Shakespeare in the 1580s, uh, George Peel, another dramatic playwright before and concurrent with Shakespeare in the 1580s, 1590s. Uh, Samuel Daniel, who is a poet who is um, not quite before Shakespeare, but somewhat concurrent with Shakespeare, at least uh, definitely so in the 1600s. The 1590s uh, is a little spotty on Daniel. There's, there's some publications, though. Um, let's see. And then what's interesting is that he includes part of the Shakespeare group, William Shakespeare himself. So William Sha Shakespeare Stratford is part of T.W. White's um, Shakespeare group. Um, he has Thomas Nash. He has Thomas Lodge. Uh, Thomas Nash is an essayist and pamphleteer. He's out and out satirist. Uh, writes a bunch of really biting satire, kind of mean and nasty, almost dark dark devilly kind of stuff uh, hmm. uh, still I'm still talking about the, the people that uh, TW White suggesting uh, um, and we can actually go up in the chart in a little bit in a second here and kind of maybe suggest some of these names uh, but what's interesting here so far is that he's got Green, Peel, Daniel, Marlowe, Shakespeare, Nash, Lodge these are all working class for the most part Thomas Lodge arguable but all the rest are all working class poet playwright characters that just need patronage uh, Thomas Lodge also was a poet playwright that needed patronage for a little bit until he became a, a doctor and, and a big wig um, but Francis Bacon Francis Bacon yeah he's, he's not an earl or anything but he's kind of He's kind of above these guys. He's he's of aristocratic blood. He's kind of a big deal. His dad was keeper of the seal for Elizabeth. Like he's not just some nobody. Like I know Thomas Lodge's dad was mayor of London. And that's not a nobody. But um, like Bacon's, you know, potentially um, going to be a lord or a viscount or or an earl someday and uh, none of the rest of this crew can say that in fact guys like Green and Peel and uh, uh, Marlowe and Daniel and Nash uh, those guys the best they can say is they went to college uh, they're all from like you know dads made shoes or you know stuff like that uh, just p poor tradesmen um What's interesting, the only guy on that list, though, that didn't go to college is Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Um, so <laughs> I feel like even T.W. White's uh, answer is uh, super interesting. Oh, we found it. We found an actual copy. That's excellent. Yeah, I Google, uh, Google just... So just yeah, like, just a quick, quick thing. Goes. This is crazy. I was looking, trying to do this on Google, actually, and like this is what I typed in. You know, I was looking, and they gave me like two pages. Couldn't really find anything. They can, I guess, they'll sell it to me on yeah, Amazon. Yeah, I tried to find it on and Google. Then, I thought, I, I, you made me look crazy. I, I was on that was on uh, that was on Google search, and then I tried Brave search. I don't know what I'm doing. Search Brave. Here's the exact same query. First thing. So yeah, search and dot Brave. Immediately uh, at shout out. And uh, also <laughs> just like super questionable on Google's 
ends? Like, are they literally filtering people from trying to read about Shakespeare authorship? Like, uh, uh, Google, uh, there's a guy on YouTube called Bright Insight, another shout out, but yeah, he was showing like, Google searches are like terrible now. Like, even if you just look up something like pancakes, it's like they have it, you, you know, they'll tell you they have so many hits. And then you try to go past it, and it just stops. And they just they just keep giving you the same hits anyway. Like it's CBC article, yeah, they, Fox article, like MSNBC uh, article, or Food Network article, mean a bunch and of baloney the exact cheese. same thing over and over again. Same, which yeah. Uh, so actually, in uh, T.W. White's here, yeah. See if you can get to a um, table of contents. So that'll give us a little. Here's a, the great cryptograph. At the uh, the great cryptogram right here, Donnelly mentioned. Oh, oh, oh. How does word my hand? Oh, I don't know how to make it flip back. Sorry, I just spent. Here we go. All that is insolent green, or haughty Rome set forth, or did come from ashes come. Something that Ben Johnson says. Oh, I thought it said green. Oh, my bad. It said grease. My bad. All right. Whoops. Here we go. Table of contents. It just went for a preface right away. Come on, little finger. Okay. Uh, sorry, folks. Uh, here yeah, what's in the table of contents in case? Here we go. Aha, no? No, that's just... Here we go. Let's see. So, um... What, what, what I wanted to show here... What I wanted to show here is just exactly what some of the methodologies of these people, uh, these writers like T.W. White, uh, General J. Watt, uh, some of the other ones that we'll see later on, uh, Constance Pot, uh, later on like Francis Yate, Greenwood, uh, Loney, Slater, um, what is some of their methodologies? Uh, and so I think a lot of these folks at this time don't have a lot of external documentation for pretty much <laughs> any of these playwrights like we just had uh, T.W. White here is suggesting you know Green, Peel, Lodge, Nash um, those guys have as little documentation on their lives as William Shakespeare does and that's something that uh, I openly and honestly agree with Stratfordians on Stratfordians feel like they're being attacked for no reason like why don't you ask this about christopher marlowe why don't you ask this about thomas haywood why don't you ask this about john webster and it's like actually no that's that's uh that's a legitimate complaint um i guess the the common answer is because those guys don't get pushed in our curriculum like you don't go to undergrad and get an english major and have to take an entire course on john webster you don't take an entire course on thomas nash you don't take an entire course on Robert Greene or George Peel, you, you absolutely take entire courses on Shakespeare. Uh, courses, you can take multiple entire courses on Shakespeare. Um, and so I think it's that sort of preference that is the cry back, that that's why we have to look into Shakespeare's authorship question, not these other ones. But I honestly think that trying to look into the Shakespeare authorship question without trying to understand the attribution and authorship questions behind all these other playwrights, including the ones that T.W. White is listing here, uh, it's a fool's errand. We have to look at all of them. We've got to look at all of them, because all of them uh, are spotty. Um, I feel like a good chunk of them are possibly spurious or speckious. Um, I think that we need to... Like deeply consider that we don't just have one little um, isolated event. You know, this doesn't happen in a vacuum, sort of thing. We we don't just have one fake name, and all the rest of these guys are just working class guys. Like, you know, it's easier to argue that all these guys are these working class guys because those guys at least went to college. But that's it; they just went to college, and now I gotta explain how Thomas Haywood knows so darn much about falconry and it knows so darn much about medicine and knows so darn much about uh, poetry and um, Italian Petrarchan sonnets and uh, drama and stagecraft and I mean at some point it, it's a difficult thing to answer um, for some guy that's uh, maybe went to college at best um, so 
what we're seeing here with T.W. White is that he's going to just go through play by play by play, and he's maybe got him broken down into different play categories. Um, but uh, his big idea is that these are all the university wits and that they're collaborating together and that they're able to collaborate together um, on into the 1590s and eventually list them in the folio. Um, but a lot of this is going to be done through internal readings. And the point with that is that whether or not that's a strong f methodology for proving authorship, that's a whole other conversation that we will have to get into. But the point is that you do have to sort of answer it somehow. Like, if, if we don't want to say that it's the exact same people writing the same passages, we do have to sort of... Is, is this just some bizarre form of convergent evolution that if Shakespeare has a passage that reads just like Robert Greene's, um, is, it, is that coincidence? They're both thinking the same thing. It's the zeitgeist of the times so that they had similar linguistic structures. Or... Is it perhaps that Shakespeare's reading from Green and um, stealing from Green, and that's why we get the Green gro Groats works with with the upstart crow stuff, which um, I don't think is about William Shakespeare. I think that's clearly about Edward Allen. I think multiple bodies of theory have shown that between the Marlovians, the Oxfordians, and the Baconians. I think they've stomped uh, the whole Groats works wit. Uh, identification of Shakespeare in it. They stomped that into the ground. We don't need that anymore. Uh, that said, um, there's a lot of ways that uh, we could have parallel passages be similar, but the point is we do have to sort of hypothesize how that happens. Um, I don't think that coincidence is a very parsimonious or uh, helpful or um, it's it's not a very convincing powerful answer. sometimes yeah, yeah it's not convincing it's it's it doesn't give us any predictive power um, we can't just put that in the next time we come across a similar issue that looks like the same pattern of issues uh, we can't just be like oh this must be coincidence too it's it's not it doesn't give us any predictive power so let's see if we can find a theory with predictive power and um, it some point for us and I'm sort of peeking ahead. We want to say that it's not just William Shakespeare that's a pseudonym. Um, we're going to say that all these other people that they're naming here, Robert Greene, Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Nash, George Peel, these university wits, they're pen names too. Um, people say, what do you mean? We have documentation. These people went to Cambridge. And it's like, um, look, you can pay people to use their name. You can pay people to use their likeness. People say, oh, that's a front man. It's like, well, they don't necessarily have to be a physical front man in, in the room. They can just literally use their name. Um, I guess they can be front men if they get sent to jail. And uh, We'll have to work through all those sorts of bumps and, and hurdles through our theory. But um, let's see. We don't have to go too much in detail through TWs here. Uh, there will be other ones that I do want to go more into detail with down into... Uh, group theory, but let's see, yeah, let's move onwards into the 1890s here, because um, uh, right around then we get Constance Mary Potts um, and her Francis Bacon and his secret society, which once again is very similar to the school of night thoughts. Uh, it possibly influences the whole beginning of the school of night. But what she's talking about specifically is a proto-Masonic group, uh, specifically the Rosicrucians. And she suggests that Francis Bacon is the founder of potentially the whole movement, if not just the English chapter of the Rosicrucian movement. Rosicrucian is a fancy way of saying Rosy Cross. Uh, Rosy Cross can be um, a multi level reference but um you can think of it with the um tudor roses um the white and the red rose of the york and lancasters uh being united with the tudor rose uh you can think of it as a reference to the blood of christ uh, the red rosy blood on the cross um so there's 
uh, national, religious, uh, probably even occult readings that you can make into them. And I don't think any of them are maybe more or less correct than the other. I think that's why uh, this supposed secret society would use a name like this, because it's got a lot of uh, imagistic and linguistic power. Um, that said, let's, uh, let's also talk about the same year we have somebody new on the scene, and uh, I think it's important that we talk about this new guy, because um, while he's never been the out-and-out -out number one favorite, he always hovers in the distance, and um, whoever is your sort of favorite amongst these sort of uh, few, whether it's Devere or Bacon or Marlowe or whoever, um, William Stanley, the Earl of Darby, is super closely connected to all those people. He's, um, his brother Ferdinando Stanley was the original patron, supposedly, of Marlowe and Kidd and maybe even Shakespeare. Um, and so he would have had plenty of chance to meet those folks. Um, purple one. Scroll up. Oh, Yep. There you go. Derbyites. Derbyites. Yep. Right there. Okay. And, um... So, William Stanley is also the son-in-law of Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, so there's a very close link between the Derbyite theory and the Oxfordian theory. Um, he's also often associated with this um, proto-Masonic movement, associated with this 1570s and 80s French court. Um, he's also often associated with the School of Night, all things that Bacon himself have, has been potentially associated with. And so there's uh, just plenty of connections between these theories, and we're going to see that over and over, that there's tons of overlap between these solo aristocrat theories, and uh, I think that's why we do see a constant steady stream of the group theories uh, and sort of reaction to that. And so, um, in 1891, James Greenstreet uh, identifies uh, some actual letters in manuscript form that are spy letters. Um, and so, by the Jesuit spy George Finner in 1599, which he reported that William Stanley, the Earl of Derby, was um, too busy to deal with any political espionage stuff. Um, saying that he was busied only in pinning comedies for the common players, a.k.a. writing comedic plays. Um, we don't have anything printed by William Stanley as a comedic play, and so we have to sort of explain why the heck... And that that's a, a real letter, that's not some fake letter. Even Orthodox scholars acknowledge that letter exists. Um, it's really the big, big basis behind the Derbyite theory. We don't have much more than that documentation, but we have a lot of connection between the French plays, whether uh, um, Love Labor's Loss or Measure for Measure or um, um, Henry the Sixth uh, or even uh, King John. Uh, all of those make tons of references and as well as some Marlowe plays as well, uh, like Massacre at Paris. Um, all these make references to the French court of Navarre that William Stanley would have been a personal witness to and would have experienced. Uh, however, he's not the only one that's going to be in our conversations that has that going for him. He also has that his brother was a big-time patron of big-time writers. He was the patron of... Christopher Marlowe, of Thomas Kidd, of William Shakespeare. All of that I will qualify by saying that we, we think he's the patron of those writers. We can't document that for certain. We know that Lord Strange's men were the original, possibly, probably original players of plays like The Jew of Malta, Tamburlaine, um, and uh, Taming of the Shrew, and Henry the sixth and so um uh that's why a lot of marlovians like to argue that marlowe becomes shakespeare's that 
uh, there's a lot of late Marlowe, there's several of those late Marlowe plays and several of those early Shakespeare plays that overlap with Lord Strange's men, and that's documented in the Hensler Diary, uh, and that's in the early 1590s. Um, by the way, this Ferdinando Stanley, this Lord Strange, the older brother of William Stanley, who is the fifth Earl of Derby at this time, uh, sorry, Lord Strange, Ferdinando is the fifth Earl of Derby at this time, he shortly after Marlowe supposedly gets murdered and shortly after Kidd supposedly dies from supposedly being in jail, uh, Ferdinando Stanley himself supposedly dies of poisoning um, after supposedly being uh, accidentally embroiled in a Catholic Protestant state level form of treason and espionage conflict um, for which he swears up and down he was innocent of um and so yeah there's there's a lot of uh, big old wild uh wild card question mark red red flag uh you know light bulb whatever the term is uh, a lot of weird wacky stuff going on with the stanley family um it's his death was mysterious. And this is wiki. You know, this this, this is old mainstream wiki. wiki. Um, but yeah, look, look, look at this part, part where it's like a contemporary, contemporary note of the Earl's symptoms, the remedies he took, and the grounds for suspicion of witchcraft survives. He fell sick at Knowsley Hall but traveled to Latham House where he took a bezoar stone and allegedly powdered unicorn's horn as medicine. Which, what, what in the ever-living heck could that possibly mean? Um... But his death was mysterious. A few months after Heskett the fair, he was suddenly taken ill with a severe and violent sickness. Poisoning was suspected. It was claimed that Heskett had treated him and that he would soon die if he did not accept his plans. He was said to have been poisoned by the Jesuits, his gentlemen of horse being suspected of administering the poison. Historian John Stowe recorded his illness in great detail. Uh, it's been suggested that poisonous mushrooms were used. Um, I, you know, I don't even know what to make of stuff like this. Uh, a lot of people want to immediately go to political intrigue and jump to, ah, he must have been killed by these people and this is all a cover-up to make him look sick. But um, after coming across so much wacky stuff and so many deaths that are like this, I don't know that that's my first recourse uh, or answer. Um, when I see things like that, I begin to wonder if this is a faked death, if this is a perfect opportunity to have another uh, uh, Christopher Marlowe type thing where we have a, a genius guy that uh, doesn't want to be wrapped up in politics and wants to just write, uh, so he wants to get out of the espionage game, all this conflict, and uh, Pulls this big stunt, acts that he's dead, gives his brother the title. Very theatrical. Yeah, and then absconds into his pen name and a uh, supporter of art, music, dance, poetry, singing. But above, uh, but above all, love theater. I don't know where the, the source is for that. He was the patron of many writers, including Green, Marlowe, Spencer, Shakespeare, and it's like man. So yeah, this is this pretty much a dude. This is a guy that you know how yeah. to you know really seal the deal or kind of really like oh man. This like, this guy sounds like. Uh, He's pretty darn important and uh, sounds like an excellent candidate for pretty Shakespeare derb important. or Marlowe or any of these guys that you might think's a pen name. Um, I wish we had more writings from him to understand him, but uh, clearly just from his patronage uh, alone, we can see that the guy is wrapped up in all of these names and all of this scene. Um, sorry, got derailed there. Uh, talking about the Darbyites, but I think it's helpful because uh, I like bringing up the Darbyites. They like saying William Stanley's a candidate, but I mean, he's just uh, like, here's another Ferdinando, candidate. Yeah. Ferdinando's brothers is good or better a candidate. Uh, that William gets to go on being the the Earl and having to do Earl type things every now and then, while We're, while he gets to just go live in anonymity and just write for a living. Talking about um, a guy, yeah, who apparently yeah loves the theater so much and. 
how much of yeah that whole uh, ambience and culture, right? And so right, yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't he just and be involved with yeah or have just said, as much like, of it, at some weight. point? I I could totally see why his younger brother William might want to join in on the action and write some as well. And so I think it's perfectly completely possible that William Stanley is a writer. Um, I don't honestly think that he's the main writer of Shakespeare. Um, the only documentation we have that he's a somebody busy writing comedies, uh, which that documentation's from 1599, that's not exactly in the midst of Shakespeare's comedies. That's, that's supposed to be the dark part of the timeline. Um, so it makes me wonder just who might William Stanley be? Uh, could he be someone, I don't know, Ben Johnson or something like that? I don't know. Uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, let's see, we can hop back to the charts. Uh, let's uh, move on. We're, we're moving on into the 1890s. And so, uh, over there in the Baconian timeline, this this whole cipher cryptogram, cryptogram thing really takes off. And that sort of becomes a main establishing line of thought. And it's also just a big invigorating influence in the whole investigation like it's so much fun every all these puzzle seekers yeah question is it all based on like the folio readings um, or is it from like any of his writings or what any of bacon's writings bacon's journals uh the promise uh which uh was a big collection of bacon writings and journals that needed to be um edited from manuscript form and the lady that did that was actually constance mary pot the lady that started the Francis Bacon Society, and so um, if you want to go read Bacon's Promise, you you uh, can read Constant Mary Potts' edition of the Bacon Promise. Um, but it's yeah, it's not just in the folio. And in fact, I think uh, applying it to the folio as a whole and not just to each play singly, I think that's a pretty recent idea, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I think the the big points uh, that the Baconians like to use is knowledge of science, whether we're talking about uh, um, geology or astrology, astronomy or medicine or um, um, natural philosophy. You know, talking about science and metaphysics and uh, epistemological understanding. Um, that's the stuff that they like to point out and make internal readings of and go point to similar readings in other Bacon works. What's nice about Bacon, we got a lot of works to compare stuff to. Um, another thing that they like to point out is, yeah, that just a lot of it seems to mirror at a general level the philosophical movement of Bacon and his politics that we see culminate in maybe Bacon's New Atlantis. Um... But another thing that they like really doing is, yeah, just it's it's not enough to write about good ideas. You have to do some really genius mathematical stuff while you're doing it. And uh, they want to, I mean, part of the fun of being a Baconian in the 1890s is you want to be the guy that's the smartest Bacon that can decode all these things. Uh, and, uh, I mean, to be fair, like, how can you blame them? You, they're, they're supposed to be... 300 years after the fact why shouldn't they be smart enough to you know decode bacon shouldn't be you know too much more difficult than cracker jack thing it's it's 300 years in the future we get we get steam engines we get automobiles we're on we're on the cusp of doing crazy things like making airplanes and stuff like that so uh uh why why can't we decode some of these bacon ciphers and cryptograms but uh yeah um either they don't exist or maybe they're just a little tougher than they understood at the time because while a lot of them had compelling ideas and maybe a few of them have correctly made some readings uh, none of these texts in the 1890s culminates to a definitive ha we we decoded all these plays and this is the whole final point uh, it was just a lot of uh bacon was here basically kind of stuff uh a lot of fancy ways of saying ah i'm francis bacon and i wrote this and um at some point there's got to be more compelling argument to all this uh cryptographic cryptogrammatic uh 
efforts. And so, uh, let's see. That's why I didn't want to put too much more on the Baconian side of things, because that's sort of the pitch there for a good while. And, and so, uh, if we continue on the 1890s in group theory, though, that's when things sort of start to get wild and wacky and fun. Um, uh, if you go up a little bit to 1895 there. Oh, where? Uh, keep going oh, a little bit. You're, oh, right. you're fine. Yeah, Wilbur Gleason Ziegler. This is a German guy. A German British guy and he wrote a novel this is a novel this isn't even an essay it's a freaking like novel concurrent with like HG Wells uh, War of the Worlds or Invisible or Time Machine I think Time Machine's 1895 uh, concurrent with Jules Verne's trip to the moon like that it's, it's what is happening in, in this era um, you know Arthur Conan Doyle and we have Wilbur Gleason Ziegler writing it was Marlowe a story of the secret of three centuries and uh in it it talks about marlowe's murder being uh, a fake sort of event and it describes the plays as by marlowe with the assistance of walter raleigh and roger manners and others and i think it is also a precursor to the school of night idea that once again we have this uh group of secret thinkers and um Roger Manners is a name that we haven't quite seen, but we're going to see very soon here. So while he's getting pitched in group theory, he's not been fully pitched as a solo writer. But Roger Manners is the Earl of Rutland, I believe the fifth Earl of Rutland. And he is the son-in-law to Philip Sidney, though Philip Sidney is supposed to be dead by, by this time. Um, but he's not just any old schmuck. He... Like, has Giordano Bruno and Galileo and Michel Montaigne as tutors and, and teachers at, in college. Like, literally just some of the smartest people in history um, are as just college professors. And, it's like, what ridiculous privilege. And uh, uh, he's not just some nobody. He's super close buddies with Southampton, super close buddies with Essex. And when Essex Rebellion goes down in 1601, he's totally connected implicated and imprisoned so he is definitely one of the major characters that we need to be looking at and this is one of the first times he's really pitched and it's in a freaking novel uh, it's it's wild this is wacky but uh um it's not wrong and i think that's why it is wild and wacky for us uh but we move onwards and uh, do you think it's hitting on that same i brought this up before but do you think because it's written in the exact same time period is that like pre titanic book and the that last president uh book as well where it's got like trump and pence like shout outs and it's like little baron trump and he's got a dog named pence and he, the same author also wrote um, something called like the last president shoot, it's like a hundred um, years before and you robert got the, chambers uh, king in yellow i want to say is also 1895 uh, sorry, i don't know but yeah and uh that that one has the uh whole prediction of world war one basically happening yeah that was a really weird thing to read and uh has the opening with the yeah the the suicide room, um, yeah. The, if, if you haven't read the the opening story, <laughs> oh my goodness, the King yes. in Yellow, I think it's the uh, eponymous, also called. King There's King so Yellow. much going on in that little story. Yeah. Yeah. From yeah, you just mentioned the suicide box, but it's like kind of two mentions, and you still have this whole other character doing Which, this uh, the, whole other uh, thing. The opening to Futurama, I think, is a shout out to that. The one of the pilot, I think it's the pilot episode of Futurama uses that uh, suicide box. Um, he gets fr he gets frozen or whatever, right? He yeah. stumbles into like a cryo thing, I think. Yeah. Um, but Bender's going into the suicide box. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's what yeah. it is. You're right. You're yeah. right. <laughs> um, let's see. But uh, let's see. J.P. Yeatman, uh, he was a literary scholar, I believe. Uh, I, I may be wrong about that. I'll have to look at him. But uh, he described the plays as written by Shakespeare with the assistance of Bartholomew Griffin. Henry Ferrers, the Earl of Derby, that's our William Stanley, the Earl of Southampton, and the Earl of Pembroke. Earl of Pembroke is Sidney's brother-in-law. That would be uh, um, Henry Herbert, who would be the husband of Mary Sidney, the sister of Philip Sidney. And um, it's all very interesting that those are the names he's using because Earl of Derby and Earl of Southampton 
there are some close connections to Shakespeare. Uh, we know that Lord Strange's men were playing plays that we have commonly attributed to Shakespeare because they're printed in the folio and attributed to Shakespeare elsewhere, like in uh, Mirez. Um, we know that uh, Venus and Adonis was dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. That was supposedly the original patron of Shakespeare. Um, and then the Earl of Pembroke uh, is the father of the two Earls of Pembroke, uh, the later Earls of Pembroke, to which the folio printing are dedicated. So there's a very literal connection between those names, and those names are kind of uh, big-time thinkers and, and movers of the time, so they're, they're pretty excellent aristocrat candidates. But who the same heck is Bartholomew Griffin and Henry Ferrer's? Um, yeah, we might have to look that up. Uh, oh, no, thank you. That was a good find. Here's this, in case anyone wants to look up. Yeah, the Gentle Here's this Shakespeare case... Vindication. I'm looking up, uh, and you want me to look up who was the other guy you were asking about? The uh, other guy. Bartholomew Griffin. Okay. And Henry Ferrer's. I gotta spell the name over here. Um... These guys. Let's see. Bartholomew Griffin was an English poet. I guess he needs to be added to our list here. He is known for his Fidesa sequence of sonnets published in 1596. Well, that's right in our heyday here. Uh, what's it say? In August 1572, the Queen made a progress to Warwick, spending several days at Kenworth Castle as the guest of the Earl of Leicester, a.k.a. Robert Dudley. At this time, a portion of the entertainment for Elizabeth was the reading of some Latin verses composed by a Mr. Griffin. This may have been Bartholomew Griffin. Griffin wrote a series of 62 sonnets entitled Fidesa, More Chaste Than Kind. Uh, the dedication to Sir William Essex, first baronet of Lambourne Berkshire, is followed by an epistle to the gentlemen of the Inns of Court from which it might be inferred that Griffin himself belonged to an inn, but no trace of him can be found in the registers. Um, okay, folks, this is this is a perfect example. This guy is a perfect example of somebody that we can immediately just say, is this guy real or not? Um, is this a pen name that we're trying to falsely identify as a person? Um, it's perfectly reasonable to suggest that it is indeed a person, but when we go and look for him in the record and find nothing, um, either we have poor documentation and he's still completely a person, or we have what should be an, a completely possible open alternative that we have a pen name here and we don't have an actual person. Bartholomew Griffin is a pen name that has been applied to, say, I don't know, Philip Sidney. Philip Sidney's writing some fancy set of sonnets and he's applying just another pen name because, you know, you can't print it under Sydney. It's 1596. He's supposed to be dead. And so if you got, uh, or Ferdinando Stanley, for instance, we, we just suggested he might have faked his, his death uh, with the poisoning incident in 1594. Um, maybe he's using a, a temporary pen name for this little set of s sequence of sonnets that he wants to put out. Um, and so... Uh, the point being that there's a ton of these names, whether poet or playwright, where we go to look in the documentation, it's, it's like slim to none, or the stuff we do find doesn't immediately add up with the theater, or even when we have several pieces of documentation, it doesn't fully explicate the... Uh, doesn't fully explicate the sort of person that would be capable of writing the plays that they've been It's kind of like the Shakespeare thing. Look, we got a receipt. He gave his wife the second best bed. <laughs> right. We, we got his donut receipt. Right. Like, it's like, like oh, okay, we got right? his donut receipt. He must have wrote Hamlet. Like, the, and it said on the, the donut receipt he got a ham kolache. 
and like he ham was, is, yeah. you know, um, they, they do that. Uh, Shakespeare, William Shakespeare of Stratford, his son was named Hamnet. And so uh, there's a lady who wrote a, wrote a really big book recently, a big time historical novel about Shakespeare's son, Hamnet, called it Hamnet. And, uh, you know, the, the big suppositions that Hamlet is largely influenced by the death of Shakespeare's son. And, and uh, it's this big tragic moment in Sh William Shakespeare Stratford's life because his, his son dies. He's estranged from his wife. And so he goes into all these tragical points uh, and starts writing all these tragedies. But, uh, um, yeah, he could have called it Hamnet instead if, if he was trying to do that for one. Like, I don't know why he called it Hamlet and didn't call it Hamnet if it was about his son Hamnet. Um, and if he was going to write about a son dying, it's pretty weird to write a story about a dad dying uh, instead of a son dying. Like, it, it's, it just seems a little bit of a stretch to suggest Stratford's get much biographical connection to the Hamlet story because of the rhyming of his son's name with the title of the play. Um, that, that's about the only connection. Um, but yeah, Henry Ferrer's uh, trying to figure out which Henry Ferrer's this is. It gets a little annoying. Uh, he could be related to, uh, is it George Ferrer's or Edward Ferrer's? Uh, he might be the son. Let me see. We got a bunch of it. We got son of William Ferrer's, first baron. Of Groby. Uh, yeah, it was kind of hard to. I couldn't find this guy. It kept getting, yeah, pulling up some guys in the 1300s or whatever. Uh, I'll put it over here. Let's see, we got George Ferrer's, uh, was a courtier and writer. So this is, yeah, uh, 200 years before us. So he wrong was dude, a right? guy from the 1550s, 60s, and 70s that wrote. Uh, one of the big time early plays, uh, Mere for Magistrates. George Ferrer's was a, also a member of Parliament, so um, I'm assuming that Henry Ferrer's is related to him, but uh, that's the best I can do. Um, Maybe just similar last name. Um, so we'll have to look further into this Yeatman text to fully explicate just who the heck Henry Ferrer's is, but uh, um, you start to see the giant contrast between the names he's suggesting. We have so much documentation of Darby, Southampton, and Pembroke. We know exactly who they are, what they did, what positions they held, what the beliefs were. Uh, some of them we even have some poetry from that we can do internal evidence on. Bartholomew Griffin is a name on a set of poems. Um, and so there's just stark contrast of the kind of identification documents and background and biographical understanding between these characters. And so um, while Yeatman and some of these group theories, they're, they're getting at some cool ideas, we can see just how far away they are from really explicating the truth with a real powerful, uh, fully holistic answer. Like, we... We, if we're answering who the heck Shakespeare is with Bartholomew Griffin, it's like uh, I feel like that's putting out fire with lava. Like uh, it's not, it's not gonna do much for us. Like we have to now explain who the heck Bartholomew Griffin is. Um. Uh. This is in that Yeatman uh, book. And so, uh, yeah, he's, um, that's the only f and Ferreris that comes up in here. But you said the author of the Mirror of the Magistrates? Yeah. Yeah, that, oops, that, that. And perhaps that's a typo on my part. Um, well, I mean, he said, look, it has a question yeah. in, in the actual book itself. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'll, I'll look into this Ferrer's name and, and I'll look into this whole essay to uh, um, see further what exactly Eaton is trying to explicate because it, it seems odd that he's pitching uh, this collection of aristocrats and potentially no-name poets. And 
um, once again, like you, you get those kind of answers when all you're looking at is internal evidence. Um, and so he's going to find a lot of internal similarities between Griffin and, and Shakespeare, but is it going to be an actual, like, there's, there's no way he can get any biography about it. Um, and so at some point it's just saying, well, maybe Griffin's super influenced by Shakespeare. Maybe uh, whoever is Shakespeare is also Griffin. But uh, it doesn't seem like a helpful enough answer just to suggest that it's Bartholomew and Griffin based on parallel passages being similar. Um, we can move on from uh, White. We can... Let's get to Stotzenberg and then um, maybe call it a day there. Um, so this is for me the big, this is the big one. This is the really important one that, um, not historically, um, I don't know how big or influential this was historically, but this is very influential for my line of thinking or our line of thinking here. Um, because he, he does do parallel passage readings, which I was just saying, aren't always particularly helpful or powerful, but in doing these parallel passage readings, um, it's not just finding some random name like Bartholomew Griffin and noticing the similarities between his sonnets and Shakespeare's sonnets or his sonnets and Shakespeare's plays. Um, he's giving us a full mechanism beyond the parallel passages. And so Stotzenberg's huge pitch, and Stotzenberg leaned Baconian, which you'll see in this chart, we got the blue arrow going towards him here. He leaned Baconian, he was a believer that Bacon's very apparent in Shakespeare, but he was also a believer, like a lot of these group theorists that we'll see from here on out, they don't totally agree that Shakespeare's folio or Shakespeare's body of work, uh, including the sonnets and uh, poems, uh, they don't believe that they're necessarily a giant unified body, that um, not all the plays read the same way, and not all of them seem like the, not all the passages within a play seem like the same writer at times. And um, even now today, our, our mainstream Orthodox scholars pretty much agree with that, like, um, at least for some plays, like, there's a lot of Orthodox scholars that want to say that, uh, Titus Andronicus is largely co-written by uh, George Peel or George Wilkins. Uh, that uh, plays like um, Henry the Sixth, Part One and Part Two, Part Three, might have the hand of Christopher Marlowe and maybe even Thomas Kidd. Um, there's lots of questions like that, and uh, it's what you call people want to call it the disintegrationist. So, if you're a believer that not that uh, the folio isn't all written by one person, uh, then you're a disintegrationist and you're trying to break apart Shakespeare. Um, and so Stotzenberg, I guess, can be lumped into that crowd, and I guess we can too, uh, because at some point his whole pitch is that Venus and Adonis and Lucrece, yeah, those are written by maybe one guy, but they don't seem to be written by the same guy that's writing a bunch of the sonnets, or if not all the sonnets. And those guys aren't necessarily the same writers that you see in a lot of the plays. And so um, what he ends up saying, I'll sum it up uh, in short here. He says, I think Bacon's the, the writer behind Adonis and Lucrece. It just has a lot of the same phrases and ideas that you see in Bacon's own writings. And it makes sense that he'd be using a pen name around that time. So, uh, you know, going along with a lot of already established Baconian theory, yeah, gives those to Bacon. Uh, but he, as much as he wants to do that in the sonnets, he read, reads and reads and reads through the sonnets, and he can't make heads or tails of them trying to go with Bacon. And so the only thing that can make the sonnets make sense for him is to say that Sidney wrote them. Like, what? You know, mic drop, uh, you know, record scratch, what? Wait, what? Car breaks, wait, what? Um... Philip Sidney, Philip Sidney's been dead since 1586. How in the heck is Philip Sidney writing these sonnets? Well, I mean, his suggestion is that these are just unpublished sonnets from Sidney's early days that finally get let out to, uh, um, you know, make sure any scandalous material that were in these sonnets are finally gone, because it they do make a lot of references to a lot of folks, and that's how he identifies it as Sidney. Uh, there's several sonnets that make references to Edward Dyer, and 
you can't make heads or tails of the sonnet without making reference to Edward Dyer. And just what in the heck was William Stratford going to know about Edward Dyer? Um, even Bacon. Yeah, Bacon probably knew the guy, but like, Sydney's, Sydney was best friends with the dude. That was his mentor. That was like a, an uncle figure. He, when Sydney died, supposedly, uh, his will had a bunch of stuff being bequeathed to Edward Dyer. He was an important person for him. Um, Edward Dyer was knighted uh, right around 1600, I want to say, maybe even in the 1590s. And uh, so Edward Dyer's, you know, big time guy, big time name, and uh, he's being referenced in several of these sonnets, and it just doesn't make sense for any other character but Sydney, or maybe it makes the most sense with Sydney. And so he suggests, yeah, this is this is Sydney, and he's uh, uh, just writing them in the 80s, and they're unpublished until the 1609, once a lot of the people in these sonnets are dead, and um, that the WH. Uh, in the sonnet dedication is just to William Herbert and it doesn't need to say to the honorable, noble, blah 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 because it's Sidney dedicating it to his nephew. It's not some uh, working class patron dedicating it to some high up lord. Um, and I don't know, all that makes a good amount of sense. Um, uh, because, you know, when Sidney would have been writing it, uh, the kid would have been, you know, probably just born. Uh, William Herbert, super young at that time, I think he's born in 1580, so probably would have been two or three when that collection's being written, if Stotzenberg's theory is right. Um, it's because of the Stotzenberg pitch on Sydney that it made me reconsider just exactly if Philip Sydney's indeed dead. Like, wait, if Philip Sydney's writing the sonnets, because there's a lot of similarity between the sonnets and the plays as much as. Um, Stotzenberg's going to argue elsewise because Stotzenberg says that he wants to look for Marlowe and Sidney in, in the plays, but he's going to specifically not do that because they can't do it. They're both dead. And so he says, you know, if we're going to look for who could write these plays of the guys that we know existed, um, boy, Marlowe and Sidney, that would be your one and two guys or two and one guys. Those, those would be your best guys to write it, but they're dead, so... I guess we got to look at guys like Bacon or who else, and so he starts looking over and over, and uh, he finds uh, in the plays that well maybe there's some lines by Bacon, but predominantly it seems like there's two guys, maybe a third and fourth guy as well, but two main guys over and over and over and over in the plays, and he identifies them pretty consistently as. Michael Drayton, uh, who was a playwright in the Henslow Diary in the 1590s era, uh, the late 90s, early 1600s, and he was a big-time poet. He wrote some uh, big-time poetical tracks that were very, very well-loved. Uh, Michael Drayton, even though you may not know him, he's not a nobody. Like He's buried right next to freaking Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Chaucer and Edmund Spencer in the Westminster Abbey. Like He's right there next to, uh, in Poet's Corner, uh, next to uh, the Shakespeare monuments and all that sort of good stuff. Drayton's right there. He's a big shot. He's a big wig. Um, but as much as he's a big wig, uh, reading about his early life is kind of a joke. We can go through it. Uh, so it says uh, up there in the early life, uh, Drayton was born... Scroll up just a little bit. Drayton was born at Hartsill near Nunchin, Warwickshire, Warwickshire, England. Almost nothing is known about his early life beyond the fact that in 1580... He was in the service of Thomas Gerrard of Collingham, Nardenshire. Uh, 19th and 20th century scholars on the basis of scattered illusions suggest that Drake might have studied at Oxford. Uh, more recent work has cast out on those speculations. So we have, we have absolutely nothing. Uh, the guy just pops up in 1590 and um, pretty soon after he pops up, he's supposedly in the so-called Wilton Circle, hanging out with guys like Edmund Spencer and Samuel Daniel, who are the big shot poets of their time uh, which by the way we can do the same little game with Edmund Spencer and Samuel Daniel um, they're super hot shot big shot poets like basically poet laureate figures for the country um, buried in Westminster Abbey kind of figures and you don't know exactly where they came from who they were where they were born in some cases you don't even know when or where they died 
and it becomes kind of a joke. Uh, it's like, was this even a real person? And so it's like, uh, wait, why would we bury Michael Drayton in Westminster Abbey if he's not a real person? Or why would we bury Edmund Spencer in Westminster Abbey if he's not a real person? I don't know. That's an excellent question. We'll have to answer that at some point if we want to continue down this line of thinking. That's a, that's a perfectly reasonable point to, to argue against us. Um, but don't worry, we'll, we'll get there at some point. Um, but continuing on with our charts, let me keep talking about Stotzenberg here. Um, so Stotzenberg finds Michael Drayton all over this stuff, and he does parallel passage after parallel passage after parallel passage, and it's pretty hard to argue with him. Um, and we also have, it's not just parallel passage, but we have in the Henslow diary that Drayton is writing a bunch of these plays, and a lot of these plays he's co-writing with Thomas Decker, who's the other guy that Stotzenberg finds all over all these plays. He can do parallel passage after parallel passage after parallel passage of Decker plays to Shakespeare plays. And at some point, um, he points out that a lot of the plays in the Henslow Diary have the same freaking name or the same ideas as some of the Shakespeare plays that, um, you know, like, for instance, Thomas Decker and Henry Chettle wrote a play called Troilus and Cressida. Do we have that play anymore? No, it's gone. It's vanished to history. But we do have a play called Troilus and Cressida by William Shakespeare. Do we know where William Shakespeare wrote that or who played it or anything like that? No. And uh, at some point, uh, Stotzenberg suggests, well, maybe, perhaps, the Troilus and Cressida that we call by William Shakespeare is pretty much the same thing as the Decker Chettle play that was originally written in 1598 or 99. Um, that that play gets touched up and reworked by Francis Bacon or maybe some other folks. Uh, he doesn't suggest Neville or Ben Johnson, but, you know, others have. Um, they get touched up in the printing of the folio in 1623, and and uh, that's why it's not the exact same, but uh, that's what it is. Like, um, And he doesn't just do this with, with one play. He does this with several, several plays. He, does it with Taming of a Shrew, does it with Julius Caesar. There's several plays where you can show Drayton and Decker's hands or thoughts are all over these plays, and they have the same names as the names in the Henslow Diary. Um, perhaps the ones that we are calling Shakespeare are indeed these ones that are listed in the Henslow Diary. Um, I've never seen a lot of decent argument against that theory. Um, they People try and argue that that's not how things worked, uh, that they couldn't just apply Shakespeare's name on the stuff, but uh, we totally have tons of examples where they would, and Orthodox scholars will backtrack on that argument, because they'll use that exact argument for why William Shakespeare's name is on Yorkshire tragedy. Oh, they just put William Shakespeare's name on stuff, and it's like, well then, why couldn't that be possible for the folio? And what you start to see is that there's a religiosity about the folio. It is a sacred document. You do not question the folio. You can question the printing of the Yorkshire tragedy, but you do not question the printing of the folio. And can we uh, question it with all these uh, crazy cryptograms like these people do? <laughs> like, you know, because then the, the Baconites are like, oh, well, that's totally fine if we, you know, do the whole, if we prove Bacon, you know, is doing the whole folio and wrote Shakespeare or whatever, right? But then what do Oxford's and everyone else is yeah, like, uh, that's so true. It's not just Orthodox scholars that hold this folio as sacred. Baconians hold this stuff as sacred. It's got so much cryptographic, uh, um, geometric, mathematical, Renaissance occult, hermetic learning, and uh, you know we're all so much better off for exploring it. And uh, you know Oxfordians just think that Oxford every time uh, he passes gas, it smells like bubble gum, and uh, because of that, uh, you know, you can't you can't doubt how good anything by Oxford is. Like, I do think that that's one of the compelling arguments that Stratfordians have against Oxfordians is that, you know, the the place that we have by Ox uh, the, sorry the poems that we have by Oxford mostly are from his juvenilia, and uh, some of them are kind of neat, and some of them are kind of cool and witty and philosophical, but some of them are, are not very great. And uh, Stratfordians like to say like. No way Oxford could write, you know, some of the sonnets in Shakespeare because Oxfordian's po Oxford's poems aren't very good. Um, instead of 
Oxfordian's answering it like, well, yeah, it's because he wrote it when he was younger, and he got better as he got older, and he worked and reworked, and um, a lot of them will recourse to say, no, they are great poems, and that you don't know how to read poetry, and um, uh, it, it just becomes a tough sell, and so um, it's because they won't take the sort of quality judgment out of it. We, we have to say that Shakespeare's the best ever to have this conversation. Because, um, you know, I guess at some point, if we don't think Shakespeare's the best ever, why the heck are we going to spend all this time researching it? What's the point? Uh, you know, if we're, if Brady and I are here arguing that Shakespeare is not Shakespeare, that there's a bunch of writers in Shakespeare, and that it's not just even in the Shakespeare folio, that we can do this maybe with the Marlowe canon, with the Johnson canon, with the Chapman canon, with the Decker canon, with... Uh, the Webster canon with uh, a lot of these uh, poets like uh, Abraham France, Edmund Spencer, uh, William Warner, uh, Bartholomew Griffin, uh, um, Thomas Campion, Samuel Daniel, Michael Drayton. Like, if we're questioning all of those guys, uh, and we're also arguing that we don't want to say that they're qualitatively better than everything else, then what the is the point like why do we even care and um uh i think at some point it's just understanding that like look we're not here speaking spanish we're not here speaking uh some super evolved vastly different language of english we're basically speaking the same language we're definitely writing and reading in the same language as these people did and predominantly because of the power of a small group of people, which includes the English crown, which includes people like William Cecil, Secretary of State, uh, Francis Walsingham, the Queen's spy master, um, Sir uh, Lord Henry Sidney, uh, Governor of Ireland. Um, you know, uh, there's what about Thomas Gresham? He he came up in the uh, with the other guy that who was Sidney's or uh, Sidney's. Father-in-law, who was the state's guy, the state, or the yeah, uh, Sydney's father was uh, the uh, governor of Ireland, but his father-in-law is Francis Walsingham, the Queen's spy master. That's him. Or no, uh, who's in, who's her state secretary guy? I feel like I'm uh, thinking of somebody else. That's William Cecil. Yeah, who's Edward De Vere's father-in-law, but uh, Thomas Gresham. I want to say he is the father-in-law to Ferdinand of Stanley. I don't know. All these guys, uh, they all. Uh, all their wives, dads are really important. Big, big shots. Um, Merchant and financier. That was Royal Exchange. But yeah, uh, Gresham, he's one of the original economists. Uh, that's where we get Gresham's Law. Uh, I don't know if he has a kid or not. Uh, uh, I didn't say so. It's not listed on his on Wikipedia. Anyway. Oh, here we go. Oh, so married to He Samantha. also had an illegitimate daughter. Half-brother's who... uh, Francis Bacon. Yep, there we go. Um, and he had an illegitimate daughter who married... Uh, he's the founder of Gresham College. There's... Oh, so his daughter married the half-brother of Francis Bacon. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. He died suddenly of apoplexy? Oh, so he had a stroke. Yeah. Uh... So, I guess we can stop here. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, go back. Oh, Next, sorry. sorry. Saw a buzzword. Uh, the foundation of the Royal Exchange is the background of Thomas Haywood's play, If You Know Not Me, You Know Nobody, in which a lord extols the quality of the building when asked if he's ever seen a goodlier frame. Um, and so, yeah, Thomas Haywood, he's another one of our sorry. playwrights sorry. that's concurrent with Shakespeare that's in the Henslow Diary. Uh, that we have absolutely zero about biographically or his upbringing uh, or his background. Uh, who's writing about really, you know, high up, fancy, cutting edge stuff like the Royal Exchange, uh, talking about Gresham's Law, uh, relating it to the markets in Venice and the markets in uh, Italy, and uh, talking about city politics and how to relate to these market exchanges, uh, it gets hard to, 
just say that Thomas Haywood's some nobody. Um, and not saying that if you're not some Earl's son that you're a nobody, because I'm not an Earl's son and I don't feel like a nobody. But I just mean uh, I don't have the wherewithal to write plays with this stuff being off-the-cuff background info like it's second nature to me. I could maybe study up enough, but I have the internet. I have a library card. They didn't. They have rich people's houses that they need to, hey, can I come over and go look at your library for hours on end? If you don't know rich people, then you uh, you can't do that. There, there is, there's no public library. Uh, you, you needed to know somebody who had a giant collection of books. Um, and so at some point, uh, that's in itself uh, a good enough argument and uh we we can end right there uh Brady, do you have any thoughts here yeah and uh last time i remember i brought up some and we're just kind of it's still interrelating so much the power of the language the dissemination of this language too and like i had read some excerpts from that uh history of the uh, muslim empire the history of the arab peoples but they talked about you know the same time that they were minting a bunch of uh, like coins and stuff because we're talking about how people have the know-how for all this money exchange form all this economic you know theory or whatever um, but during the time of this yeah Muslim Empire you know it's a big deal to also bend coins you know with your emperor's face and you know uh, kind of show who's you know who's who as far as who's got the monetary uh, capital or whatever right who which which value of currency is going to be worth something right and concurrently of course you know with the Elizabethan state is yeah the massive undertaking of redoing all their currency uh, with all of our with all of our best friends right like Gresham like you were just talking about and um, uh, William Cecil's in here as well um, yeah from this article that we have pulled up from the Royal and, uh, Museum yeah, Greenwich to, to sum it up it's, it's talking about when Elizabeth comes to power they get a huge currency issue because it's uh, being cut it's being watered down it's not completely standardized they don't know how to fix the money system after she's come into power remember there's a lot of turmoil before elizabeth she's not coming in as the most legitimized uh ruler and so uh th there's just a lot of shaky unstable stuff happening at the early elizabethan things she needs to buckle down she needs to submit power um part of that's by doing sort of totalitarian despotic things but part of it's super boosting your economy getting a big fat stack of cash to be able to throw power around with and so the first thing she does she goes and gets her buddy thomas gresham and um let's see uh it's not just gresham it's guys like cecil guys like walsingham but specifically gresham specifically cecil they're in charge of this uh, program and they need to take this debased money and flip it into worthwhile money and they go through this whole process uh, melting down old money and reminting it and in doing so they're able to reestablish and revalue the, the money system totally restandardize it and they somehow made a profit off of it which seems a little sketchy but I, you know, I'm not as sharp as Thomas Gresham, uh, and so they made not just a profit, but fifty thousand pounds, which, you know, it's, it's in the order of millions or billions these days. Uh, um. Yeah, and then just it's just you know I like pulling out those parallels, just you know because we're talking about uh, empire, we're talking about imperialism, right? And so you know, like I just had likened last time that it's you know a lot of this bard poetry language uh, creation. At the exact same time that's going down, you just see some of these other geopolitical things happening at the exact same time that seem to cement these uh, imperial powers, right? You know, like the you know mincing of the coins, and boom, we have you know exact same example here between these two time periods that we're you know just comparing for precedent or whatever, right? That hey, this kind of stuff for you know you can and kind of follow some of the follow the money, so to speak, whatever, right? And and uh, I th I think that's an excellent point because that goes back to our last episode. That was the real big influence uh, or emphasis that uh, Delia Bacon and Walt Whitman were trying to get at. That's like we're not just making like internal readings of some play and coming up with some wacky ideas. Like they're they're reading these plays and saying hey wait 
everything this play is advocating for uh, mirrors something that's happening historically um, either right before and like justifying it and sort of validating it or reiterating something or uh, the play is talking about something that hasn't quite happened in history but happens right after the play and it's almost like the play sort of priming or programming uh, in a lot of ways and um, I think almost with every play in the, the Shakespeare canon and uh, the extracurricular canon whether the apocrypha or just related writers uh, a lot a lot if not all all these plays uh, fit into this mode or pattern where um, the things that are happening right before it it's reiterating and uh, or even revisioning and reshaping and the things that are happening right after it are you know being primed and programmed for and uh, I think that's a super powerful reading and that's going to be sort of the mode of literary criticism that we want to go with forward for our own theories not the only one but sort of the main uh, lens or the main point of view and so that that Whitmanian idea that this this has to be somebody that's largely not just in the know but in the say as well like not just seeing what happens behind the curtains but somebody that's helping move stuff behind the curtains uh, that that seems present in the plays and in the history and in the relationship between the two and uh, where it will be difficult for us is trying to parse through all of that because it's not always immediately clear. And Whitman says that. Whitman says, look, any, any really good hotshot detective or sleuth is going to want to jump on this. You're going to want to bust down and get to the bottom of it. But it's going to be darn near impossible because they specifically threw hurdles along the way. They threw dead ends. They made it into a labyrinth. The... Uh, if you want to get all Kubrick and Shining on you, uh, it's going to be difficult to get out of that labyrinth and to trick Jack Nicholson, <laughs> um, a.k.a. sort of prove this authorship theory beyond just doubt of the Stratfordian question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't call it like a post-colonialism exactly analysis you know but it's just yeah we're just you know like you said it's not just the internal readings but there's some it's not just the cryptograph it's some it's not just the genealogies and the uh you know the connections but you know it's definitely yeah. part of it it's not just the, I'd the say historical if, trends if you're one but, of these uh, hardcore uh, uh literary philosophical types out there uh, um i guess you could say we're coming from the frankfurt school um we're trying to make a Frankfurtian reading of the Renaissance era, that it's the people at the top that control things and that they send out the propaganda and that they're the movers and sayers and they're the ones establishing the social and government systems underneath them and we as commoners have to react to their uh, social structures and that ultimately uh, they're there because of the capitalistic system and uh, you know, the Frankfurt School's coming out of uh, a, a Marxist line of thought. Um, so I guess if, while we don't agree with everything with the Frankfurt School, that's, uh, if you want to sort of reduce it down to a label or a category, that's sort of the line of thinking that we want to apply. Um, but it's specifically not just a Frankfurtian anti-elite um, bent, but also a hidden agenda, a crypto uh, agenda, the secret agenda that, um, it, you know, it's not just that the state's doing it from a top-down way, it's that we don't get to see that fully, that it's not transparent, that there are lies and cover-ups, that there are, um, you know, ulterior motives and agendas, that this isn't just... Uh, to make just the darn th best three hours of, of your play going life uh, that these plays are meant to shape and establish cultures, societies, and histories at large. And uh, yeah, I guess on that note, uh, let's see, yeah, you can scroll up to the top here. And I think we, uh, this is a good stopping point. Okay. We're pretty much where we usually are, but yeah, so uh, we've kind of continued down. We're hitting like, you know, the early 1900s and we're kind of, it, it, I think with Stotzen... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm muted myself. But with Stotzenberg, uh, as we kind of continue down here, I think it's a good one because he's it's it's 
it's not like any of these people are quite wrong on these solo archetypes, you know, but they just, they got their guy and they just kind of want to sit there in their little corner, you know, they want to, you know, fiddle and tinker with the cryptograms or do the internal readings, but then you got to got, you know, someone like Stotzenberg, I guess, who's kind of like, hey, they're, you know, we can, we can really open up this, uh, line of inquiry here you yeah know, and everyone you know everyone has a you know a say why are we all kind of pitching in you know the different the different leads kind of coming up with a absolutely uh, I, but he said you know you said he's mainly a baconian uh, i don't know what but a lot of these people like we talked about with delia where they kind of view this the whole project is a, a, a benefit right i don't know what his take on it is uh, exactly either so, but, uh, uh, um, or, what i like about stotzenberg specifically is that it's not just him pitching uh, names that seem like the personality would fit or something. It's that, like, one, he's trying to find uh, similar writing styles, which, yeah, is down to interpretation, but two, that, like, there's actual, like, reasonable documentation for trying to suggest those writing styles are similar. And so when you see that some guy named Thomas Decker wrote a play called Troilus and Cressetta, you want to see, hey, does Thomas Decker's stuff seem similar to this play that we have called Troilus and Cressetta? And like, boom, lo and behold, it's super similar. And um, so I think because of Stotzenberg, we can like actually kind of take Philip Henslow's diary pretty seriously. And we can actually start to look at the names in the Henslow diary and treat them with a little more respect and a little more focus and say, hey, maybe it's not just the Shakespeare that's up for question. Maybe it's a lot of these guys in the Henslow diary and um, maybe not just up for question, but worth our time and effort not just for authorship questions, just but to read in general. Like Thomas Decker has several plays that are really awesome. Like uh, honestly, I think Decker's better at writing comedic plays than Shakespeare. Are they always quite as philosophical? Um, perhaps, perhaps not. Um, but Thomas Decker plays are really funny, and they're pretty darn similar to Shakespeare plays. And in fact, I'm pretty convinced uh, that. Thomas Decker wrote several of the Shakespeare comedies, and um, I think that Stotzenberg does a good job arguing that. One of them being Taming of the Shrew. Um, so yeah, we, we, we can uh, call it there. Yeah, we'll, we'll work our way up until we get to the Oxfordians, and we get to Gilbert Slater, and we get to the 30s, and sort of the heyday of the uh, alternate theory candidates, and then we start to get to the decline in the 40s, and I gotta finish out the chart. Um, and then we'll get to the 50s when the question starts to vanish and uh, sort of by then it's become established as a crackpot theory. Somehow somehow it's still completely okay to be an alternate authorship thinker or a, a Shakespeare doubter. Like, you may not be part of the orthodox scholarship, but it's not like a taboo. At some point it, it becomes taboo and... Uh, Maybe it's somewhat related to the McCarthyism of the 1950s. Who knows? Um, we'll have to dive into that deeper. Uh, I guess that's it. Thanks for listening, folks. Uh, Y'all stick around uh, later on. We'll have episode four coming out. We'll finish, hopefully finish out this timeline. And then uh, hopefully in the future, we can look at some of each of these aristocrat um, art, um, candidates in solo so we can just do a whole episode on edward de vere do a whole episode on francis bacon do a whole episode on blank 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 um we also kind of want to do some shout out episodes maybe an open letter to the oxfordians and do an episode just talking about oxfordian theory and how it can expand and what more it needs to answer sort of thing uh, maybe do an uh, episode writing to the shakespeare authorship trust asking them uh, you know where they're at and talking to them, talking to them about what they need to do and uh, that sort of thing. Maybe a sponsorship, you know. Yeah, uh, shout out. Yeah, if you guys want to start including us, uh, we're a long ways away from getting exactly where we want or where we need to be, but um, we do want to get our thoughts down and uh, get the discussion going and invite anybody else out there that wants to have this discussion to have it with us. And so uh, uh, we hope to grow as uh, podcasters and YouTubers and we hope to especially grow as a authorship uh, questioner. So, uh, yep, thanks for s sticking with us and uh, joining in, and uh, tune in next time. Yeah, drop any uh, tidbits or uh, yeah, call-outs on us, and uh, hope to see you around in the next.